What's up, everybody? Welcome into the Next Pets Podcast. I'm Phil Perry. We got a great episode lined up for you today because we're talking to Jennifer Lee Chan, my friend from NBC Sports Bay Area, covers the Niners, has for a long time, going to share with us some insight in terms of how this team looks right now. I know typically here on this podcast, we're looking ahead. It's the Next Pets Podcast. What's coming next? What is way down the line? Let's look into their immediate future with Jen to talk about the injuries the Niners are dealing with, the path to keeping this game close if you're the New England Patriots, your double-digit underdogs. I'm not sure there are going to be a whole lot of people picking you to win this game, but can you keep it close? Let's get some great ideas there from Jennifer Chan when it comes to how she would attack this team that she covers on a daily basis and where they've been weak of late because they've been weak in some pretty critical areas. They're one and two right now. They're also desperate which might not make it the best place to land right now if you're the New England Patriots. Be that as it may, we will talk to Jen in just a little bit. The way I wanted to start the podcast was talk about four of the most critical individuals in the organization in 2024 and why this is a massive week for them. Why already in week four are we at critical junctures for head coach Gerard Mayo, offensive coordinator, Alex Van Pelt, starting quarterback, Jacoby Brissett, and backup for now, quarterback, Drake May. Let's start at the very top with the head coach. Huge, huge week for Gerard Mayo. It's been described to me by players as a fork in the road kind of week. Now, why is that? And why does it relate specifically to Mayo? To me, this week is a culture test. What kind of culture have you been building It hasn't been an incredibly long period of time since Gerard Mayo took over the head job, but it's been long enough that we should see signs of the culture that he's trying to implement this Sunday in San Francisco. The reason I say that is because they laid an egg that we all saw on Thursday night last week down in New Jersey. They didn't show up. No energy, no emotion, loss of fundamentals. Is that just a blip on the radar? Is that a fluke? Is that just a classic Thursday night dud? We've seen it before. Team shows up, short week, on the road. You're behind the eight ball. You don't have that emotion. You don't have that energy that you need to be able to bring your best. And you get rolled. That happened to the Patriots. We all saw it. The question is, is it going to happen again? Because if it does, that to me is a red flag. That to me would lend itself to a lot of, I think, in some ways, legitimate Applications of the panic button (laughs) across the greater New England region. Why do I say that? Because one of the reasons Gerard Mayo was hired, and I believe this is why this will look differently on Sunday, is that his ability to communicate, his ability to have a message resonate, his ability to connect and motivate, I think all of those things are real. Those are, those are part of the reason why he was hired to be this team's head coach to succeed Bill Belichick. If ever there was a time to have your message resonate, to be able to get a little bit more out of players, to connect with those players and let them know how important this is, to follow up last week's performance with something much better, this is it. This is your time to shine in that regard. Because what we saw last week was not all about X's and O's. I would say a lot of it was about talent. Look in the trenches there, offensive line versus the Jets defensive line, Patriots receivers versus this Jets secondary. Like, yes, sure. High likelihood that they were not going to win that game no matter what. Even if they had brought all of their energy, even if they had emptied the bucket, so to speak, when it comes to that football emotion that you'd expect from any professional team. But certainly a team that is on a week-to-week basis from a talent standpoint, going to be outgunned, outmatched. But they didn't even give you that opportunity to assess how it would look if they gave it their all, if they were able to tackle, if they were able to be representative in terms of their physicality. But they weren't. This is a huge week for Gerard Mayo and the culture that he's trying to establish because it has been at times a hard-driving culture. I think it has been the antithesis of, at times, what many thought it would be with Gerard Mayo. Oh, he's going to come in, he's going to replace Bill Belichick, so it's going to be a much softer, kinder, gentler New England Patriots 
coaching staff and they're not they're going to let the players do what they want and they're going to allow the players to to have a say and it hasn't been that way they ran what was one of the hardest camps they've had here in new england in years this camp was much more difficult than many that bill belichick has run in foxborough especially in recent seasons i think gerard mayo in terms of how direct he is with players and specifically what i've been told are one-on-one conversations with these players in terms of what they need to do better, it's not a lot of hand over the shoulder, hey, it's going to be okay, guys. It's very frank. It's very honest. It's very direct communication about what you need to do better. You sucked in area X, Y, and Z, and we need more. What's going on? How can we help you get to where you need to be? Or this is just flat out what you need to do. Those are the kinds of conversations I think that can be had with somebody like Gerard Mayo because he has already established relationships with a lot of these guys. So when you're able to have that foundation of, I care about you, I want to do whatever I can to help you succeed, that's my job here as head coach, and we're going to be better off as a team because of it. And then you can go to that player in a, in a quieter setting. doesn't necessarily have to be in the meeting room in front of all 52 other players on the active roster plus 10 or 12 more on the practice squad plus trainers and staff and coaches and nutrition and you don't have to do it in that setting you can do it in a more personal setting where it might resonate a little bit better with today's player so those messages are still being delivered are they being accepted and are they doing anything for the players themselves that to me is something we're going to see on sunday Okay, so if you've seen energized, if you've seen an energetic group, are they still going to have a lot less talent than the team on the opposite sideline? Yes. Are they still in all likelihood going to lose? Yes, I think so. But if they can keep it close, if they can be much more competitive, if they can bring some sort of energy to put them in a position where they are a play or two away from potentially upsetting what many thought would be one of the best teams in football on the road this year, that's a check for Gerard Mayo and the culture that he's trying to establish here in New England. How about Alex Van Pelt? Critical juncture for Alex Van Pelt in terms of his willingness to adapt. I think we've already started to see it. How far does it extend? How much are the Patriots able to change in a short period of time in order to be malleable and adjust to the situation that they've been given. We know what the situation is. The offensive line has been terrible. They can't get behind on the chains. They can't get behind in terms of down and distance. They can't get behind on the scoreboard. All of those things are death for them. And so for Alex Van Pelt, I think this is a big week for him. Run game, pass game, schematically, what do you got? Number one, I would say he's already started to shift. Do we see a continued shift? Because there's an argument to be made that there should be a continued shift when it comes to the types of runs they're running. When the Patriots run their wide zones, keep it on the ground, Ramondre Stevenson, Antonio Gibson, doesn't matter, whoever it is, they haven't been good. 2.8 yards per carry. They've run wide zone 22 times this season, according to Sports Info Solutions. On half of those, 11 out of 22, their running backs have been hit at the line of scrimmage. That, to me, suggests there is some disjointedness when it comes to the offensive line and the tight ends and the people that are supposed to spring those running backs free on those looks. It might mean that the running backs aren't seeing it, amazingly, on a snap-to-snap basis, because maybe there is a hole there, and they're not able to find it. They end up getting bottled up for a stuffed run or a tackle for loss. 2.8 yards per carry on wide zone. That's what Alex Van Pelt has wanted to be. It felt like all we saw in the spring and in the summer, wide zone, stretch plays, quarterback, hauling ass, horizontally, meeting the running back for the exchange, offensive line, hauling ass to the sideline, and then watching the running back try to cut back, get north, and create yards. They've started to... If you look at it big picture, get away from that. Only three games into the season. I give Alex Van Pelt credit for that. Because 
on every other type of run this year. So exclude the, the wide zone where they've been a disaster. 2.8 yards per carry. That is not sustainable. Every other type of run through three games, they're averaging 5.1 yards per carry. So that's downhill stuff. Power with pulling guards. Duo, double teams at the line of scrimmage. It includes inside zone as well, which can at times look a lot like duo. Okay? But downhill, between the tackles, get north and south, and do it quickly. Those types of runs are working. 5.1 yards per carry. They're one of the best teams in football when you're taking out of when you're removing wide zone from the equation for everyone across the NFL. The Patriots are basically a top 10 rushing offense because they average over five yards per carry on all that other stuff. So can Alex Van Pelt shift more towards that, right? 22 uh, wide zone runs this year. It represents about a third of all of their runs. So they are right now two thirds everything else and one third wide zone when that's supposed to be his staple. So again, tip of the cap to Alex Van Pelt for his, his willingness to adapt to what this team is doing well, what his personnel would suggest they can do well, which is get downhill and run behind those big bodies like Michael Wenu and Layden Robinson. Those guys are big, powerful dudes. City So when he gets back out there, if he gets back out there, run behind those double team blocks. Let those guys work up to the linebacker level. Let them clear a path and go. Forget all this running sideways junk and trying to get upfield. That just doesn't feel like what this team does well right now. Maybe they will later with more reps, but right now, less wide zone, more gap, and I think you'll be better off. Let's see what it looks like this week for Alex Van Pelt. I think this is a big week for him in that regard. When it comes to the pass game, two things that interest me this week specifically, and I think this is a, this is a critical juncture. We're about a month into the season. Let's see what you have in this regard, Alex Van Pelt. Play action passing game. Was able to dig up some really interesting numbers, courtesy of our friends at Next Gen Stats. Has the play action passing game been married to Patriots runs? In my opinion, they have. Now, my buddy Greg Bedard does a great job, has a very keen eye for all things football. Was on Felger Maz, 98.5 The Sports Hub earlier this week, talking about how those two things are not married, in his opinion. They run a lot of wide zone boot action, play action passes, but they haven't really established those wide zone types of runs, which we just discussed here. They haven't. He's right in that regard. Those runs have not been good. And so why would opposing defenses respect those boot action, play action types of plays? Well, they probably don't. He's probably right on that front as well. Now, where I disagree in, in what the numbers would suggest and what the tape would suggest is that they don't really run a lot of those. Some of them might stick out in our mind's eye because of the way they've looked. For example, the very first play for the Patriots offense against the Jets. Wide zone, boot action, play action. There's a defender in his lap as Jacoby Brissett is trying to make a throw. And he ends up somehow getting a throw off and completing it to Hunter Henry for zero yards. Bad play, behind the sticks. Drive is essentially dead because you can't survive being in second and 10. And it starts rolling downhill on you from there. So maybe Greg just put a little bit more weight on that particular play just because it stood out in his mind's eye. But what I was able to find was that on the 17 play action calls that the Patriots have had this year, 16 play action attempts, one of them resulted in a Jacoby Brissett scramble. Of those 17 play calls, I found only four that were true wide zone boot action throws. The rest, so that's less than 25%. The rest look like duo at the line of scrimmage, or they look like power at the line of scrimmage, and they'll pull a guard, and Jacoby Brissett will pull the ball out of Ramondre Stevenson's belly and look to make a throw down the field or throw a screen. They've had a number of play-action screens, which is sort of in its own bucket in terms of types of plays because the screen game is a little bit of its own thing. But they haven't run a lot of those wide zone boots. And actually, when they have, surprisingly enough, there have been openings there. There's been some meat left on the bone by Jacoby Brissett. And he would even acknowledge that. I talked to him a little bit this week about a variety of different things, and he would acknowledge that that missed a Austin Hooper early in the game against the Jets, uh, deep down the left sideline. 
that ends up being a big play. They're down 7 nothing at that point in time. That would have put them on sort of the precipice of points. Maybe if, even if it's just three on the board at that point, it just changes the flow of the game and how you're able to approach it. So can you continue to marry the run and the pass, these run actions that you like, that I think you probably should run more of given the success that you've had with them, duo, power, et cetera, getting downhill with your play action game. And do we see even fewer boots moving forward? Because it hasn't been a huge part of their offense four times in 17 play action calls. Does it go away completely? Do those completely evaporate? Because they're not running it well with those looks. They're not really throwing it well with those looks because Jacoby Brissett, it's not really his game. Getting out on the move, rolling out, making throws on the run. Can he do it? Yes. Is it where he excels? I would say no. I would say somebody like Drake May has a better opportunity to make those types of plays because of just his fluidity as an athlete and the strength of his arm to be able to make those types of throws off platform. The other thing I think that it's more important to, excuse me, important to mention when it comes to Alex Van Pelt, critical week, run game, pass game, just as sort of another branch off the pass game. Where's a quick game at? What do you got in terms of quick game, Alex Van Pelt? Because we know he has it. Right? We actually saw some of it with Drake May at the end of that Jets game. But they need to get the ball out quickly, and Alex Van Pelt mentioned this specifically in his press conference this week with us. We just spoke to him about an hour ago. This is a get-the-football-out-of-your-hands type of game, and that's primarily because of Nick Bosa and whatever the Patriots are going to have at left tackle. You can't sit back there and pat, pat, pat it. Problem is, for the Patriots, Jacoby Brissett is near the top of the league in terms of time to throw this year, according to Next Gen Stats. He's fifth in the league right now, just over three seconds be- on average, three seconds between snap of the football and throw down the field. Now, part of that is because he's had to scramble around and avoid pressure. And so that leads to a longer time to throw. And a lot of those plays for Jacoby Brissett this year have been good plays. He's avoided sacks, he's avoided negative plays, and good for him. Wouldn't begrudge him that at all. But part of that number is due to the fact that he is. In my opinion, and in the opinion of of some football people that I've spoken to, deliberate when it comes to his process behind the line of scrimmage. And I think part of that is by design for him. Think about the way he came up. Third string quarterback, backup quarterback, thrust into starting situations. He's been dying for opportunities like the one he has this year where he's just, he's given the job and as long as he can play well, he's going to hold on to that thing, it looks like, until they determine that Drake May is ready. But I think the Patriots would love for him, if it was going well this year, I think they would love to be able to sit Drake May for an extended period of time. Maybe get him in at the end of the year and see what he has for sure, but let him sit, let him marinate behind the scenes if this guy, Jacoby Brissett, can really excel in the offense. I think they would love for that to happen. But Jacoby Brissett is, by nature and by play style, certainly relative to the rest of the league, risk-averse. A historically low interception rate right there with Aaron Rodgers does not put it into harm's way all that often, even for a guy who is working with receivers who have trouble creating separation. Patriots are one of the worst teams in football when it comes to their pass catchers creating separation, according to next gen stats. And yet Jacoby Brissett is more towards the middle of the pack of the league when it comes to his percentage of quote unquote tight window throws. How does that make sense? If his receivers are always covered, why is he only in the middle of the pack when it comes to his percentage of tight window throws. Because there are other quarterbacks in the league. Brock Purdy's one of them, believe it or not. Dak Prescott's another. Where their receivers this year, for whatever reason, haven't created a lot of separation. But those two quarterbacks are two quarterbacks that are examples of quarterbacks with extremely high tight window throw percentages. It makes sense. The receivers aren't getting open. And so if they want to make plays down the field, they're going to have to throw to covered receivers. That yields the high percentage of quote-unquote tight window throws. But Jacoby Brissett, I think in part due to, to his play style and what he likes to do when he's behind center, he's going to be a little bit more conservative than those players. And it would make sense, by the way. I'd rather throw to C.D. Lamb or Brandon Ayuk in a tightly covered situation than I would anyone on the Patriots roster. So I'm not saying these are bad decisions by Jacoby Brissett, but It is what it is. Patriots are getting very little out of their passing game. 
I actually went up to Jacoby Brissett in the Patriots locker room this week and asked him, do you think you need to take a few more risks to try to squeeze a little bit more out of this offense, this passing offense in particular? It's not been productive by any metric. And so is there anything that you can do to take advantage of what might even just be what looks like a, a half step of an opening for one of your players? Do you feel like you're turning anything down in that regard because you don't want to turn it over? Because turnovers for this team would be death too, let's be honest. So it's a tough spot for him. But I was genuinely interested in his thought press process as he goes through this. Does he feel like he has hesitated at all, that he's left any meat on the bone, that he has seen, oh, Austin Hooper, I could maybe try it there. He's, he's sort of even with his coverage player, and if I float it out to this spot, maybe he could go and make a play. I wish I could have had that one back because I would have tried that. I would have tested that. That's, that's one example. That's a, that's a play-action throw from week one of the regular season where I thought he might have had Hooper um, deep down the field towards the end zone, running towards green grass. He's tightly covered. In the moment when Jacoby Brissett hits his back foot. But do you trust your receiver to go make that play if that's the kind of throw you want to make? What Brissett told me was he does feel like he's taking risks. You know, might not say it in the tight window throw rates on next gen stats, but he does feel like he's taking risks. He does feel like he's throwing the ball down the field. And to his credit, unlike the way the Patriots offense was constructed at times with Mac Jones and Bailey Zappi, the Patriots aren't at the bottom of the list of offenses in the NFL when it comes to average depth of target. They are pushing it down the field every so often. They're just not hitting. So big week for Alex Van Pelt. Big week for Jacoby Brissett. Can you get the football out a little bit more quickly? Alex Van Pelt's going to be calling these types of plays. What does it look like? Does it look like more screen game? Are there more bunch sets, more stacked alignments where you can use some contact you know, right around the line of scrimmage with your pass catchers to create openings, picks, rubs, whatever you want to call them. Get the ball to the perimeter quickly and try to let somebody like Pop Douglas, who can be explosive in small spaces, can you allow those guys to make the play with the ball in their hands? That, to me, is something that that is going to be really critical for Alex Van Pelt to show and for Jacoby Brissett to show as well. Because, listen, this could be an inflection point for the Patriots offense, if things continue down the path they started on on Thursday night, even if they're bringing that energy and that emotion, all that stuff that I think it's important for Gerard Mayo to try to draw out of his players this week because I think it's going to be a reflection of his culture, even if they're bringing all that, if they're still right around 100 yards passing, even if they're not turning the ball over, and they just it's becoming clear that they can't make plays in the passing game, and it's not just because of what they have at left tackle. And it's not just because they might be lacking a number one receiver. They are lacking a number one receiver in terms of their personnel. Then the, does this game become the inflection point for the Patriots offense? And do we see a change at quarterback? Does Gerard Mayo look at it? Does Alex Van Pelt look at it and say, we really do need somebody who can get rid of the football a little bit more quickly. Jacoby's just a little too deliberate for what we have on the offensive line right now. We do need somebody who can get outside the pocket and make a throw on the run, who can use his legs to pick up critical first downs for us in meaningful situations. Jacoby Brissett's done that too. But do they feel like Drake May gives them a little bit more? Are there, are there parts of Drake May's game, whether it's the release time, the athleticism, the accuracy down the field. Again, that that miss to Hooper was a game-changing play to me against the Jets. If it's another week where they feel like there has been, to use that phrase again, some meat left on the bone, down the field especially, this is a team that can't miss its opportunities to create chunk plays in the pass game. Just can't do it because those opportunities are going to be few and far between. And when you have them, you got to make the most of them. If there are misses of that ilk this weekend, does that lead to a change to Drake May? And that brings us to Drake May. I've had the opportunity this week to ask a variety of different members of the Patriots organization how they would assess what they've seen from Drake May in practice this week. And the responses I've gotten have been overwhelmingly positive. I had one defensive player tell me he looks really good. He's been smooth. 
in terms of how he's operating the scout team offense. Had another player tell me he has made some throws where it's like, all right, young fella. And it feels like we're competing. We're going back and forth. That was a member of the secondary for the Patriots. Another player, when I asked, are there moments where you can see why the Patriots would have taken him third overall in the draft? He said, oh, yeah, for sure. He's getting through his reads. He's making good decisions. And that answer resonated with me because you would think if Drake May was impressing people in practice, it would be with the no-look pass, with the accuracy down the field with the ability to get out and scramble and extend plays and make it really hard for defenses to to keep track of him and his receivers because of his athleticism in the pocket. But it hasn't been that. It's been his decision-making. It's been how he's operated the offense, whether it's the Patriots' offense, because we know he's getting 30% of the first-team reps, or the scout team offense, giving the starters on the defensive side a good look. And had one offensive player tell me one of the reasons he's been really good in practice is that he's not BSing around out there with his scout team reps because that can happen. It's my understanding. I haven't asked a whole lot about scout team quarterbacks over the, my course of time covering the NFL. <laughs> but it sounds like over the course of the last few days, in other areas around the league, you will sometimes get scout team quarterbacks who suddenly want to make it about them. They want to make it their show. But then you're not really running the play as it's called on the card, and that can lead to defenses getting frustrated because they're not getting a real look, and the quarterback's not under any threat of actually getting hit. And so what kind of risk is he really running by scrambling around back there and trying to make throws off his back foot? It's generally speaking not what you want to see. Those plays with Drake May will happen. When he's out on the field, in the regular season, and the bullets are live, the playmaking stuff is just going to come out because it's part of who he is and because that's his instinct as a football player. But to me, it's things like, boy, he's playing on time and in rhythm. He's not BSing around on the scout team. He's running the play as it's called. He's going through his reads. We can tell he's going through his reads, and he looks smooth doing it. I had one player, one offensive player, tell me today, even his ability to communicate the play has become significantly better from where it was, say, a month ago, where he's hearing it from Alex Van Pelt. He's trying to repeat it back. If you're a fan of this podcast, you've listened to Drake May and his cadence just at the podium, just with a microphone in his face. And He's a fast talker, (laughs) and he's got that North Carolina little draw to him, and it was difficult for some players to just understand him in the huddle at times. But now he's delivering these play calls with confidence is what I've been told. Much more clear, much more confidently. And so those are the things to me that make my ears perk up. When I talk to other players – And when I'm asking them if they can see number three overall pick type of talent from the backup quarterback, when they tell me things like he's playing within the structure of the offense, that he's making his reads, that he looks smooth, that we like the decisions he's making, that he has command of the huddle, that's not, boy, you should have seen this no-look throw he made the other day. Or, boy, you should have seen it when he threw it going out of bounds off of his left foot across the field to a wide open receiver in a scramble drill situation. He has that in his bag. We know what kind of athlete he is. We know what kind of physical talent he has. If he's impressing his professional teammates, these are NFL players who know what succeeds at the NFL level. If he's impressing these guys because of his command, because of his timing, his rhythm, his decision-making, his command of the huddle, that to me for Drake May is even more impressive than the physical stuff because we know that's the stuff he needed to work on the most. And now it's the stuff that's coming back to me first in conversations with these players. So this gets back to the Jacoby Brissett conversation. 
critical juncture for Jacoby Brissett to show that he can do a little bit more for Alex Van Pelt to help Jacoby Brissett do a little bit more within the structure of the offense because it feels to me, talking to players and, of course, of course, the coaches, whether it's Alex Van Pelt, Gerard Mayo, even DeMarcus Covington. I asked DeMarcus Covington today about the kind of look that Drake May is getting, and he's telling me we can see him getting better day by day, week by week. When you hear all that and you put it all together, it feels to me like, and nobody has told me this when it comes to Patriots decision makers, it feels to me like we're going to see Drake May sooner rather than later. I have long said October. I feel like that's enough time to get a good idea of how the rhythm of the NFL schedule works, how to prepare during the week, how to watch film, what the speed of the game is like, seeing it from the sideline level, going over the pictures with your coaches in between series, trying to make adjustments in-game, trying to game plan, going over the plays with Alex Van Pelt. Here's what I like. Here's what I don't like. Practicing against an NFL defense on a daily basis for a month, a month plus, that to me feels like a good amount of time, a fair amount of time for Drake May to not be fully baked. He's not going to be fully developed. He's not going to be at his ceiling. He's not even going to be close. That's probably not going to be until year three or four. But is he going to be ready to play? I think he will be. And so, barring a, a push from Jacoby Brissett and some signs of life from this Patriots offense, given what I'm hearing from players, again, not from decision makers about when they want to get this guy in the field, but it sounds like they've been impressed. And when we're not in a position to be able to watch practice on a daily basis, that's what we have to go off, are the opinions of the people that are there that are seeing it in real time, up close and personal. And I've talked to a number of players. I've talked to about a dozen players over the course of the last two days alone. And again, the response has been overwhelmingly positive. So we'll see. We'll see how the Patriots coaching staff feels about it. How much of their decision on when to play Drake May is based off the performance of the offense and Jacoby Brissett in particular week to week and specifically this game because there's a nice little landing spot for Drake May potentially week five at home against the Dolphins. Will that be it? I think that could depend on how Sunday against the Niners goes. How will Sunday against the Niners go? It's that time to get the inside look on the San Francisco 49ers and what the Patriots should try to do this Sunday afternoon when they head out to the Bay Area. Here's our conversation with the great Jennifer Lee Chan, NBC Sports, Bay Area. There she is. There's our friend Jennifer Lee Chan from NBC Bay Area. Jen, what is going on with this football team? One and two. The San Francisco 49ers should not be one and two right now. They should not be. I'm looking at some of the numbers here. 30th in the league in yards allowed per pass attempt. They're 30th in the league in third down defense, 21st in points allowed. What's going on with this football team out there? They're supposed to be Super Bowl contenders. I know it's not your 2023 defense that you're seeing out there. That's for sure. And they just had another blow with Javon Hargrave being out for the season with a torn tricep. So, I mean, if any team's going to have an opportunity to get some yards on them, it's this week with the new England Patriots coming in because they're going to be doing some adjusting Javon Hargrave out. I mean, he was really having a good game, especially in Los Angeles, stopping the run. And they've had trouble in the past, the past three weeks. So it's going to be an adjustment period. And I think with Traverius Ward being out with a hamstring injury last week before the Los Angeles game, I think that kind of set him back a little bit. Talano Hufunga, everybody loves him, but it was his first game back. So I think the communication was off. I think they're going to get better especially in the back end with the secondary as they progress throughout the season. But right now looking a little bit suspect. How would you try to attack them defensively, Jen? Because the Patriots offense, the defense has struggled of late too, but the Patriots offense sort of is what it is. And, and they are trying to put this thing together with, you know, chewing gum and duct tape and, you know, trying to MacGyver this thing just to <laughs> generate first downs, never mind points. How would you attack this Niners defense. So you mentioned Hargrave being out. The one thing the Patriots, it looks like, might be able to do well on a relatively consistent basis is run the football. Do you think they'll be able to do that? Should they be trying to do that again this week? I mean, if the 49ers play like they have the last two games, Patriots should be able to move the ball on the ground because they have not stopped the run consistently throughout the last two games. And without Javon Hargrave, 
I think it's going to be an issue. Also, Leonard Floyd had a really good week one game, and then he hasn't really shown up on the stat line since then. So if they don't get extra pressure opposite of Nick Bosa, I think that defensive line is just not as good as it has been in the past. Are there other injuries that that should be impactful for this game? For instance, we see George Kittle on the injury report. We see Brock Purdy on the injury report, although I believe he was listed as a full participant despite his injury yes. early in the week this week. Are these issues that are going to be nagging for these players come game day? And could it impact what they're able to do? I'm thinking specifically offensively now when we're thinking about some of the big mm-hmm. names that they do have available to them. Right. I mean... Yeah, he, Christian McCaffrey is out for a while. Debo Samuel did not practice. George Kittle was back on a limited basis on Wednesday, so I would think he could play on Sunday. But, I mean, the way Juwan Jennings played in Los Angeles, I mean, he tried to put the whole team on his back. He and Brock Purdy had a really good connection. What we're all waiting to see is that – Brandon Ayuk, how is he going to level up his game? Because he really, since he held out through training camp, hasn't had that same chemistry that we've seen in the past with him and Brock Purdy. So that's an element of the offense that really hasn't shown up on the field yet. But Brock Purdy, you know, it could have been a statement game for him without all of those stars for him to pull off a win. Now, he played really well. Juwan Jennings played really well, as of course. But they didn't get a win. I think it was one of those games that it would have been a statement game for Brock Purdy to say, I can do it without all these stars, but because they, the other phases of the game didn't level up, they didn't get to do that. And it's, you know, not that anyone doesn't believe Brock Purdy is a fantastic quarterback, but to win without all those stars, I think would say a lot. How much desperation are you sensing from the Niners right now? Because again, you know, I was saying it sort of tongue in cheek, but The reality is this is a team that has Super Bowl aspirations. They can't go one and three. I don't think anybody does think they're going to go one and three here, Jen. But like, are you are you feeling are you sensing from that locker room this week an urgency that even though they're banged up, this actually might be a bad week for the Patriots to visit San Francisco because they're so ticked off about what happened in L.A. They're ticked off about having a losing record. Are, Are they are they even more thirsty than they would be otherwise because of the way the season started for them? Oh, absolutely. I definitely think they've got a little chip on their shoulder now. I don't think there's any panic in the locker room. I think there's a ton of panic outside the building with fans. But of course, that's always the way it is. But inside the locker room, they were very solemn after that loss in Los Angeles. But no panic. I think they were mad at themselves for all the mistakes they made because it was within hand. I mean, the the Rams didn't have a lead until the final two seconds of the game. So to let it slip away from them, I mean, it really is on them. Yes, the Rams played a good game. But I know that the 49ers players are looking inward at what they did and mistakes like Ronnie Bell dropping the pass, you know, the the missed field goal granted a 55 yard. It is not a gimme, but also the P.I. They had 111 yards in penalties. So if they still play sloppy on Sunday, the Patriots will have a chance. Yeah, interesting that the special teams aspect of the game impacted the game as much as it did the other day. That's an area where you would think a team like the Patriots, you know, where they they are lacking talent across the board, that can be for them when they are at their best be some sort of equalizer. So we'll see if they end up being able to make a, pl- a big play in the kicking game. Jen, the one thing I wanted to ask you before we let you go is, is a little bit more big picture because here on the Next Pats podcast, we like to talk so much about team building. And especially now with the Patriots being where they are, it's a new front office. It's a new head coaching staff. They are the definition of rebuilding right now. Is there an aspect of what the Niners have done to get themselves to the point now where they are considered widely Super Bowl contenders year in and year out that you feel like is replicable, right? There are a couple things that that are have worked out and I hate I hesitate to call it fluky because I want to give them credit for hitting on Brock Purdy in the seventh round right like that's not something that the Patriots are going to try to replicate they're probably not going to be able to get a franchise left tackle because he had like some sort of disagreement you know with the medical staff with his previous team and you know he ends up being available via trade like those things are pretty rare what's one of the smartest things though that John Lynch and Kyle Shanahan have done to build up this roster that the Patriots might be able to say okay there's a blueprint there Let's try to do what they did. Is there anything that comes to mind for you in that regard? They went after guys that love the game of football. 
And, you know, it's my 11th season covering the team. And I can tell you from when I started and it was Jim Harbaugh's last year to now, it's a completely different attitude in the locker room. With all the mistakes that they had, there was no finger pointing. There was no blame. Everybody took it upon themselves to do, you know, I could have played better in the game. That was the consistent theme after afterwards. But I think if you don't love the game of football, you don't want to put in the extra work. And they have gotten guys like Christian McCaffrey, who, yes, he's injured, but when he's there, he is one of the hardest workers. And you've got Fred Warner, hardest worker. One of the great stories I've heard about Fred Warner is a young player asked him, you know, he was working on the sled after the practice and the young player is like, how many reps do you do? He's like, there's no rep count. It's when it feels right. So, I mean, you've got leaders in there that are hard workers, that are film junkies. I mean, that trickles down. And I think part of it is also you've got John Lynch and Kyle Shanahan who are as honest as they can be, not just to media, but to the players. They don't pull any punches. I think the honesty also trickles down. And when you've got that going on, it builds a healthier locker room. So then if guys make mistakes, like Ronnie Bell dropped a pass that could have turned the the game around. It could have been, that could have been the win. There was no blame. I mean, there was a ton of blame in media and amongst fans, but they all had his back. I mean, it was there, but there was so many mistakes across the game that they all took ownership. So I think when you get guys that love the game and are responsible and really mature, this rookie class is the most mature rookie class I've seen. And part of it is the COVID year. A lot of them played four or five, six seasons in college. Also, the, the money that they're getting in college now they're getting paid. So this is not a huge shock to them. They have gotten money before. It's not like, Oh, I've got money. Now I can go be crazy. No, they've gotten money in college. They're more responsible. A lot of them have families, they have kids. So I think there's a little bit more responsibility level and just, I guess, I mean, that's really it responsibility and no pointing fingers and just, they're so close. I mean, I know it's, it sounds cliche, but a lot of players that have come in from other teams have said how special this locker room is and how special the organization is. I love that answer about getting guys who love football because it it does. It sounds like a simple thing, but I mm-hmm. think when you look at the roster now and whether you're looking at their highest paid players, whether it's Christian McCaffrey or Trent Williams, it's clear those guys are football junkies. And then I think that extends into um, some other core pieces for the franchise. Like the, I think part of the reason you're able to hit on mid round picks, right? You know, second rounder, Debo Samuel, um, third rounder, Fred Warner, fifth rounder, George Kittle. Like, I think it's, it's no coincidence that you're able to find guys in later rounds where it's supposed to be harder and harder to find these players. If you're mm-hmm. looking for the same thing and it is that, passion for it's that intense devotion to this sport and it makes it easier to hit on guys when you have that so maybe that is something that the patriots can replicate right it's not a means to an end it's a love for the game which is different i mean like i get it there are players the people you know guys out there that okay this is the one way that i'm going to be able to make money and have a living and money for my family but there's that and you know, this want and need to play better football. And there, along with that, you've got Kyle Shanahan who explains the game in an entirely different way, which, I mean, Trent Williams said he still, when he came over and joined Kyle Shanahan again in San Francisco said, it's eye opening. So when they see like how all 11 players work on the field together on both sides of the ball, I think it, gives them a little bit more purpose on the field. They understand what their job is. So they're not just run blocking to run block. They understand that when they get out into the second level and they're run blocking, that it's for a giant, you know, explosive play for Christian McCaffrey or Jordan Mason, whoever it is, they understand the purpose of why they're doing it. So it's not, you get guys that want to block because they know what the end product is. Now, how about Jawan Jennings? He might be the best run blocking receiver in football, and then he blows up. He looks like a true number one who's going to, you know, be making a ton of money someday if this continues on this track, given what he did last week. Jen, thank you so much for spending so much time with us here on Next Pats. Fascinating to just see this roster in person. I know it might be missing a few big pieces, but it'll be a lot of fun uh, to see this team this weekend. It'll be a lot of fun to see you. Looking forward to it. Thanks again for being with us. Of course, looking forward to seeing you on Sunday. All right, great stuff there from Jen. 10-point dogs, 10-point dogs. I didn't feel great about the six-and-a-half-point spread last week against the Jets. Could not have been more wrong about that. Apologize 
to everyone out there that may depend on those score predictions for whatever reason on this here podcast. But I'm going to make another prediction right now. And I'm going to have the Patriots covering again. Is that a mistake? Am I not giving enough weight to that ugly Patriots loss to the Jets on Thursday night? Maybe I'm not, but that's why this week four game to me is so critical. It gives us more context for that Thursday night loss. Is that really who they are? Could it really be that bad for the rest of the season? I don't think so right now. That opinion may change depending on what happens on Sunday in San Francisco. I have the Patriots losing this game, but I do have them covering this game. This is going to be a 24-17 to win for the San Francisco 49ers. One-score game. I think the Patriots are going to play in a lot of one-score games this year. I think they might lose a lot of one-score games this year. But if they come out with that energy, with that enthusiasm that was completely lacking in Week 3 against the Jets, that, to me, is a positive sign moving forward. Thanks so much for listening here, guys, to the Next Pats Podcast. Really appreciate this. We missed our episode last week. It was a short week. I came down with something. I was flat on my back for about two or three days there, but we got down to Jersey. We covered the game. We gave you an aftermath pod on the Patriots Talk Podcast. Make sure, by the way, that you go check out the latest Patriots Talk pod with Dante Scarnecchia. That thing is phenomenal. You got another one coming out with Matt Mayoko from San Francisco. Also, NBC Sports Bay Area insider, phenomenal, phenomenal reporter. Again, has done it for a long time. Uh, Nobody knows this Niners team better than Mayoko and Jennifer Lee Chen. So we're hitting you with both of those voices on the podcast at NBC Sports Boston this week. Hope you enjoy those conversations. Enjoy your weekend. Enjoy the game. And we'll talk to you right after the game on the Patriots Talk Pod on the Aftermath. And we'll have another Next Pats Pod for you next week. We'll talk to you then. 